Every now and again, I do an interview with an artist where it takes me completely off guard and it exceeds my expectations. Coming up, a singer-songwriter who is so amazingly cool. She fits into this category. She tells us the story of her biggest hit. She even walks us through it on her guitar, performs it. And if you aren't already a fan of this particular artist, you will be after watching this. Hey music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. If you love the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, the classics, true classics, you're gonna love this channel. Subscribe below right now to be a part of this every day and get insight directly from the artists who have written or created the music. And do check out our latest merch. I'm wearing the Professor of Rock experience uh, right here. You go to professorrock.com, you can see that. Also check us out on Patreon. Both of these things help us to do more interviews, more videos, that's the idea. So I've done a lot of interviews over the last decade and I just love it when I go into an interview and I get knocked out by the artist as a human being. You know, where my expectations are just blown out of the water. It's those moments where I'm looking at my camera crew and they're looking at me with the same uh, flabbergasted intensity, like, wow, this person is really cool. Coming up is one of those times where I walked away from this interview, walking on air, big smile. I'm not even gonna introduce her, I'll let the interview speak for itself. So let's get into it. As we go into this interview, I do wanna thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. At zenny.com, you were able to customize your eyewear with a prescription lens or non-prescription lens. If you just want that really cool look or a distinctive color or a particular style of lens, you go to denny.com, it's very easy. Check it out today. Here's the interview. Ooh. Ooh. That was a song that had two lives separated by an ocean. You had a huge break in the UK and a huge break in the US. Yeah. Two different stories. And I want to talk about that because mm -hmm. that's a really mm -hmm. cool story. Yeah. How it went to number 20 in the pop charts, but number one on the adult pop charts yeah. here in America. And then it did well in the UK. And, and the VH1 course. country chart. Yeah, I know. What? Who would have thought? It's the most unsustainable <laughs> number one anyone's ever had. No kidding. <laughs> but the first one in the UK is that Nas had to call in and cancel, right? The so Jules, Jules Holland. Holland, later with Jules Holland, is the superb music TV show in the show. UK. For those who aren't familiar with it, Jules Holland was a member of Squeeze, hugely talented and respected musician, yeah. and now 25 years of presenting this show where he brings completely disparate acts together from, I mean, from the Temptations. A great the, musician the himself. Stones and, who, and a great musician. So he'll bring all the way from the top echelons of, of success all the way down to someone no one's ever seen before. And he puts them all in the round and we all perform in front of one another with a live audience. Uh, he interviews a few people and it's got the potential to as I showed uh, for the record, um, it's got the potential to completely catapult you into right. a new existence. You only had 24 hours because... So Nas, yeah, Nas the rapper was due to be on the show and his father was playing trumpet on the single and his father took ill. I've never met Nas, I do need to say thank you yeah. to him for that. And uh, I just had no time to think about it and I was on tour playing distorted clarinet and beating a metal box with a bar. Uh, in my friend's band. <laughs> and my label boss was not very happy about this. He was like, Katie, you can't go on tour with another band when we've just finished making this record. Uh, and I was like, Shabs, nothing is gonna happen. It's not even out yet, you know? Of course, like two weeks into the tour, I get this phone call. And the scouts for the show had come and seen me rehearse. And I hadn't started using a loop pedal until after I'd finished right. making the record because I was so bored of coffee shop, smelly cat, Phoebe from Friends. <laughs> yeah. Smelly cat, smelly cat. Better. I was like, I can't do that anymore because it's not representing. Right. And now actually I can play like that and I do feel like it's my own thing, but I just felt like I was part of this confessional open mic night, depressing girl singer songwriter thing. And I didn't, right. I needed to do my own thing away from that kind right. of stereotypical sound. And actually it was the sound guy, Mosh, uh, Moshik from Oi Voy. I was in one of their rehearsals. I said, Mosh, I've just, I need something more. What can I do? And he had an Akai Headrush loop pedal in his bag. 
and he brought it out and he was like, check this out. And I'd seen um, a guy from Canada called Son of Dave use a loop pedal before and he just does like beatboxing and shaker and harmonica. He's like this weird sort of nylon Elvis. And then um, Jim White, the guitarist as well, I'd seen him do some looping with guitar. Jesus drove him out. I'd never seen anyone do both at the same time. Mostly that was because the thing only has one input, so you kind of have to choose whether you're going to do guitar or microphone. Right. And of course you can get tons of different loop pedals now, but I tried it out, and my eureka moment for me was like, surely if I just beat the out of my guitar, it's going to sound like a drum kit. Yeah. I was like, let's go! And I was like, <laughs> doof! And I played it back and it just went, boo! And I was like, oh, that doesn't work. And so we just messed about with EQs and Mosh was able to help me get a situation where we went into a little splitter and I could put both my guitar and my vocal into one box and then take one lead and go into one input. And now I have like six things going into a desk and into its Prince level of like mixing on stage. Right, it's right. ridiculous. <laughs> um, and actually Black Horse was written basically working out how to use that gear. It was literally, can I write a song that has something musical in it, not just a beat that can repeat and isn't wildly irritating? And some people might disagree with that. Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, and and it's, it, it, it's a blues song. But so just you and the tambourine, me, and, tambourine the and the loop pedal. The loop pedal. It was weird because when I came to do Jules Holland, I said to Shabs, my label boss, I was like, what should I play? And he said, oh, play that woohoo thing. And it wasn't on the record. It had not been recorded at all at that point. The record was finished, it was mastered. And I said, Shabs, it's not on the album. What, right. what are you, why would I do that? He was like, shut up, just play the horse song. It'll be fine. And so I go on, it's Jules Holland. I get to the studio. Making their television debut from St. Andrews in Scotland. Please welcome Katie Toadstall. It's Anita Baker, Jackson Brown, The Cure, the future heads oh, and yeah. me. Jeez. Absolutely amazing night. And I've been playing this coffee shop version, you know, of Black Horse with a little loop pedal, doing all the gear myself. And people liked it, but it wasn't like they're spilling their coffee in excitement, you know? Right, right. It wasn't a huge deal. Right. So I wasn't expecting anything major and I win the online poll for best artist with The Cure and Jackson Brown and Anita Baker on the no show. No kidding. So I woke up to, and I was running my own website at that time and answering all the emails, and I woke up to mayhem. <laughs> and everyone I knew in the world, like, texting me, saying, what? And it was funny because it aired about a week afterward, or maybe a few days afterwards, but I was back out on tour. And I'd been a little overwhelmed by getting a deal and making a record and it all just, I was a little bit saturated with how much information and change it was. Right. So I hadn't actually, t we were supporting another band called The Earlies from Manchester and there was about 15 of us on that tour, the, the main band and me and my friend who was supporting. I hadn't told anybody that I was doing my own thing. So mm -hmm. only my friends knew. And uh, we'd made great friends with the, the main band and we were playing this place in York in the UK, which had a tiny little, in a bar, TV screen in the corner. And I said, guys, do you mind if we watch Jules Holland? Because I'm going to be on it. And they were like, what the? F You're on Jules Holland? And I was like, yeah, I do my own thing. And they were like, yeah, obviously. Yeah. So we're all, everyone's left the bar and we're just huddled around this tiny, like 12 inch TV screen. And it was the weirdest feeling. I knew I'd nailed it. And I myself watching it back. Wow. It was, I was so anxious that I was going to make a mess of it, knowing that it was done. It was already done. Gosh. And then the really, the funny thing about that was too, that when I was playing, there's my heart forsaken and I, I have to kick back in. I stop yeah. the pedal for, this, for the break, I come back in. I was, for some reason, wore these big hiking boot, stupid shoes, and I missed <laughs> the button on the performance. So there's two bars where you would think the beat was gonna come in and I missed it. So I'm ding, 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 and then I brought it back in. 
and I come off and Anita Baker's drummer, amazing player, comes up to me and goes, hey KT, see that moment where you did a break and then you come back in? I thought you were gonna kick it and you didn't, you waited. <laughs> I love that. And I was like, <laughs> thanks. That's uh, great. Do, I'll do that again. No kidding. <laughs> wow. So it was kind of seat of my pants. And here we are like 14 years yeah. later. Well, and then in America, it gets covered on American Isle, which you weren't a huge fan. I'm not a huge fan of, yeah, of that, that I mean, type of a listen, show. It's a TV, It's a great TV show. Mm -hmm. All of these reality pop shows, they're phenomenal TV. And the thing that pulls at me is that a lot of People I know say it's the only time their family get together and watch something together. Right. You know, it's it's a it's a fun thing to watch together. But in terms of the music industry, I just wish there was an entire separate platform Agreed. for TV music because there aren't extra platforms for people who are grafting and writing their own stuff. And right. they're not creating, they're very rarely creating stars with longevity who are writing it's original about music. hitting that, that money note as opposed yeah. to writing a song like... Just the way you Tom are is Petty, not gonna come out, yeah. Yeah, would Tom Petty or Bob Dylan have survived on a show like that, even though they've written the greatest songs well, of all time? Well, would any of us go anywhere near it? Because who the f are you to tell me what I should, that I don't sound right, <laughs> or know. that I should be more like this or more exactly. like that? Or I should wear this, like, no! But it was a great opportunity because Catherine amazing. McPhee and covered my, it yeah. and it went, I mean, literally my after that performance. My whole justification of being in favor of the situation yeah. was that not many people knew the song at right. that point. Because it was number 79 at the time that it, it was, was performed yeah, yeah. and it went to number 28 overnight. Yeah. And, and, then, and yeah. with those shows, the strategy is usually just to do a cover that everybody knows because right. they're going to vote for it because they like the song. Because they like the song. And it was so cool that she went for a new artist and a song people didn't really know. But I caught some cold and I shouldn't have done it and I won't forget me. I don't. And uh, I met her actually a few years ago and I yeah. thanked her deeply because it did make a big difference for me for well, sure. When I heard it for the first time, it reminded me of Bonnie Raitt. Oh, when I heard be, that, I was like, be. this is great. Let's talk about the breakdown of the song and if the spirit moves you at all yeah. to kind of show how you came up with certain things because I love the Bo Diddley, of course, uh, the, the yeah. beat. And the yeah. count off to the start. Yeah. Where did that come from? Kind of break that down if you Let don't me like. try and remember. So I'd done the Jules Holland show we hadn't recorded the song. It went mental after the show. And so we brought forward the release of the record in the US, so that, but we didn't have a recording. So actually the first 10,000 copies of Eye to the Telescope in the UK have the audio right. from Jules Holland. And we had to rush record this song. And it said no, 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 I said no. Not the one for me. And we recorded it in a similar way to how we did Eye to the Telescope, was pretty much me and a drummer. And then adding, if we needed other musicians, we'd just bring them in, but it was basically, the core of it was me and a drummer. I think I played a bit of bass on it, but it's very, very stripped down. It's mostly, uh, I actually had forgotten the, the breakdown of it and was reminded recently that there's a cone track, which is also, really important and it's all just percussion sticks on the rims it's so much about percussion but i'm a massive fan of playing single string on acoustic and i i think it comes from busking playing on the street and right. wanting to create a, the whole band but i love writing to bass lines i love writing based on bass lines so um it was really about using that low E string as the basis, so. But I think the counting was just an old school blues nod, you know? One, two, three, five! And also just to give it the energy of a live performance, that you're outside of the rolling silence record, right, right. you know? <laughs> right. um, that rawness to it. 
If I ever give a kid a guitar lesson, the first thing I say to them is, cover the strings over. You don't need the notes yet. If you want to be a rhythm player, sort out your rhythm first. So I was just like, because I started as a picker. Um, and as soon as I started playing on the street, I was like, this is not going to work. <laughs> no one can hear me. I'm going to have to stop playing a nylon string, go to a steel string and learn how to use one of these guys. So I would always say to someone to just get there literally up and down. And no matter what rhythm I'm playing, I'm basically doing that. And I'm just highlighting different accents. So the other thing, which is a really big thing for me for playing is swing. And that's why my choice of drummer is also super important because you can get fantastic rock drummers, but they're just, they're so on the straight all the time. And it's, and it's, I really want someone to have that groove and that swing. So the, that's the, that's Black Horse. And I kind of feel like if you heard that on the radio, you'd be like, oh, this is Black Horse and the Cherry Tree. Yeah. <laughs> And it's all about the stops oh, yeah. as well. And, uh, and I've never really sat and worked it out. It's just been trying to get what I can hear. Duh, 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 which is the Bo Diddley thing, of course. And uh, so you're really just going. But to me, it's harder to do that than going. Yeah. So you're actually using your hand to help you with the rhythm. And because you're hitting the guitar, you're getting that extra yeah. percussive rhythm. And, and so when we were making Out of Telescope, me and Steve Osborne, the producer, we were listening a lot to that old like Alan Lomax blues, kind of anonymous blues recordings from, uh, you know, Mississippi. And all of that good stuff. And Nashville, Psycho, yeah. Hillbilly. Yeah, and so much of it, First of all is natural mixing. So when they're recording, it's one microphone and you're just placing people in the room. And if you've got a solo, you step up to the mic and then you step back again. But so much of it was bunches of people in a room stamping and clapping. So you've got this and this great kind of flaming group of clapping. So we were working a lot on that. And then, of course, with blues music, there's a real tradition of a cappella singing along with just percussion. So you're going. Woke up this morning. Yeah. Dog was dead. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So um, I think that there's a real power in hearing the voice alone. It's hard to do it without being contrived and without sounding really cod blues, you know? So you've got to uh, find a place where it feels natural. And um, so that's what I did with, with Black Horse. So with the verses. And then the difference, of course, was that I'm putting the woohoo into the loop pedal. So I've got backing vocals going right. through, which really helped with that feeling of being in a room with a bunch of musicians, like getting yeah. that vibe going. And the other good thing about the loop pedal is it sounds crappy. And that's great as far as I'm concerned, because the more hi-fi something sounds, it's just, I want some crunch and I want some grit yeah. in there. It's really going to help. And uh, lyrically, yeah, I read Super that you weird. were on a, a moped to Greece. Yes. Tell me that story because okay. I love that. So the story of uh, the moped. <laughs> <laughs> I was on holiday. I would take trips to Greece when I was younger quite a lot. And it was a great place to go um, a while back because it was very, very cheap. And it was a lot of backpacking that would go on. I rented a moped. And I'm on my moped and there's an olive grove and it's all these tiny, stunted old olive trees. So you kind of feel like a giant, right? There's old trees, but they're all really low. And a huge black stallion had obviously broken free and was just going crazy in the middle of this olive grove. So that was just a, one of those kind of 
David Lynch moments of seeing something that just seemed, felt like you're in a dream. And then listening to a lot of old blues and that kind of, you know, Robert Johnson idea of being at a crossroads and not knowing which way to go. Man at the crossroads. The so it is just, it's, it's basically a, a crossroad point and you have to decide light or dark. Which way am I going to go? I said, don't look back, just keep on walking. Ooh. But it really was an exercise in automatic writing. I don't, I, I, I wrote it very quickly. And uh, the meaning of it kind of ebbs and flows, changes. I've and, heard a metaphor for good and evil and yeah. kind of staying on your path, fighting against the darkness. But it's not really judging either, right. you know? And the Heart Stops Dead lyric. And my heart hit a problem in the early hours, so stopped it dead for a beat or two. I was read that that referred to a heart murmur that you had as a child. Is that oh true? Oh my God, I'd completely forgotten about that. But yeah. yeah, I did. So when you were playing it, you had the layered courses and thing. Did the woohoo just kind of come like you were saying? You're kind of doing a blues before, thing? It came before, I think I came, it came before I started writing the lyrics because I was just trying to find a motif that would work through the whole song. I mean, I don't know how Ed Sheeran does it. He'll like record, I think because his songwriting, he will keep on the same right. chord structure. And I go for quite an old school style of songwriting where there's, there. I, I'm very melodic. So I am going through and I want my choruses to go somewhere else. And I right. certainly want my bridge to go somewhere else. Uh, quarterly. So it's very difficult to keep the same thing going all the time. Um, and Black Horse is one of the few that I Because it's an unconventional way of writing because the woo-hoo is the thing that people remember, but they also yeah. remember the, oh, that, yeah, that part. Yeah, yeah. So it's not the verse, chorus, verse, chorus, basic A, B, B, A, yeah, or yeah. A, B, A, B there's song. Others, there's yeah. other stuff going on, yeah. Right. <laughs> And then you do the duet with Daryl Hall on Live from Daryl's House. That was really cool. One Q single of the year was nominated for a Grammy, but it's also been used so much in pop culture. It's been used yeah. in so many movies and TV shows. And I remember my kids found it on Band Hero. Oh, they yeah, would, you sure. know, They would play that. And then Ali and AJ. Yeah, was yeah, another yeah. way that people found it. There's also the opening theme for Wild Roses, the oh, CBC yeah, yeah, drama. Sure, sure. Yeah. It's an amazing time. It was just like yeah. watching fireworks going off. It was to just go like, zero to a hundred that quickly, and to have two different opportunities that happened in the U.S. with that experience with American Idol, and then in the U.K. Yeah, it was just meant to be. And it happened on the Today Show too. The guy who booked the music usually it was like a five six week in advance thing, and I went into his office and just played in black chorus. He was like, "What are you doing on Tuesday?" And I was like, <laughs> "Yes." So really, really cool. I suppose really, I'm just most grateful that I don't have to have another job. And that was actually the prime drive for me becoming a musician. Because I would be grateful sitting here if I wasn't famous and if I wasn't playing to thousands of people, but I didn't need another job. You know, it was just about that moment at 15, 16 and going, I want to do this as a living and I want to make a living as a musician and I don't care if I don't have clothes or don't go out to restaurants or don't go on holiday. I just want to enjoy my days making things. I just want to make stuff. Create. And um, I think the most important thing as a musician is having your own signature. And my younger brother was born profoundly deaf. And one of the most emotional moments of my whole musical life was being in a supermarket and he'd had a cochlear implant so he could finally hear frequencies in a much clearer way. And Black Horse and the Cherry Tree came on the supermarket stereo and my little brother turned to me. He said, is this you? And I just burst out crying because not only did it mean he could hear, but it meant I sounded like me and he knew what that sounded like. Oh, so that was amazing. And, and I think that overall, that's that for any new musician asking me advice, I was just like, make sure people know who the f you are within the first four bars. I can forget that cause my heart forsaken me. Isn't she cool? Make sure to leave us a comment about 
KT Tunstall and this catchy hit from back in the day. What are your memories? What are your thoughts about the interview? If you like this video, we invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you. Also, we invite you to check us out on Patreon and our merch. Again, this helps us to, to curate this channel. The idea is to keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.